Uh, I'm absolutely delighted to honor and introduce Daniel Mendelssohn, who is currently the Charles Ramlett Flint Professor of Humanities at Bard College. I have to confess that Daniel is one of the very few authors whose writing I find almost impossible to stop reading. He's the closest thing to a siren I have in my life. I have to read his books tied to a mast. This was certainly true of his three mystery memoirs, The Elusive Embrace, which he published in 1999, The Lost, which came out in 2006, and the book he'll be discussing to us today, An Odyssey, A Father, A Son, and an Epic, which came out last year. These books are narratives of self-discovery, self-fashioning, and such brilliant and such entertaining sleuthing that I confess again, I'm unable to put them down. Daniel's work is firmly grounded in his classical education. He earned a BA in classics from UVA and a PhD from Princeton and published his revised PhD dissertation as a book, Gender in the City, in Euripides Political Plays in 2012. He's also published a two-volume translation of the collected works of the modern Greek poet C.P. Cavafy in 2009. Daniel's hallmark is a literary and cultural critic uh, for such publications as New Yorker, New York Review of Books, New York Magazine, among many others, is his creative and economical application of ancient literature and culture to modern cultural criticism. He's published two books of his essays, Waiting for the Barbarian, 2012, and How Beautiful It Is and How Easily It Can Be Broken in 2008. Daniel was recognized for his service to classics by the Society for Classical Studies in 2014. Daniel has won a number of prestigious mentions and awards for his writings. His honors, and I'm being very selective here, include the Madison Medal from Princeton University, Harry Versell Prize for Pro Style, Guggenheim Fellowship, Barnes and Noble Discover Prize, NBCC Citation for Excellence in Book Reviewing, and the George G. Nathan Prize for Drama Criticism, to name a few. But I could talk here all day about Daniel, and I'm going to now let him come up and talk for himself. Please give a, a hearty welcome to Daniel Mendelssohn. Thank you. I'm okay. Now you can hear me. I have so many microphones. I feel like a CIA informant. <laughs> um, thanks. Uh, David uh, for that nice introduction. I'm really happy to be here uh, for a number of reasons. Um, the first is that, uh, what, how are we doing on the sound? I'm getting a little buzz here. A little loud. Yeah, it's probably a bit loud. A little. Is that better? I don't even need a microphone. I come from a family of screamers. <laughs> when my mother used to call her cousin in Tel Aviv, we used to joke that she didn't actually need the telephone. <laughs> Hello, it's New York. Um, uh, so I'm happy to be here for a couple of reasons. Uh, first is that uh, the first person that I met in the fall of 1986 when I went to Princeton to study classics in graduate school was David Rosenblum. Uh, who intimidated the living daylights out of me at the time, and he is still so much smarter than I am. <laughs> I'm embarrassed uh, even to be talking here today. Um, he was the most animated, the most lively, the most passionate uh, of all the graduate students um, about our studies, and you sort of got swept up in his enthusiasm uh, for everything. We also shared uh, an advisor in the distinguished and now retired uh, classicist Froma Zeitlin, who you are shortly going to be hearing from in the excerpt that I'm going to be uh, reading. Um, I was just telling uh, David uh, that I was on the phone with her last night. She's now uh, in her 80s and, and retired, and we were talking about uh, a friend of ours whose kid just got into Princeton as an athlete. Uh, He's a broad jumper. And I was talking on the phone with her, and she says, I cannot believe that he got into college because he can jump in the air. <laughs> um, so uh, 
<laughs> to be a student of Froma's was quite an experience, let me tell you that. Uh, and the second reason I'm happy to be here, uh, so it's nice to see David again, which I intermittently do at classics conferences, uh, um, is that I am now officially part Baltimorean, because uh, my sister married into a, a long line of Baltimoreans, so I feel that this is a special uh, occasion. Um, I'm um, here to talk to you about this book that I uh, published last year, which has just come out in um, paperback, uh, which, like these other books that you just heard uh, David mention, um, is a sort of a memoir and sort of a reflection on an ancient text, which I've now done uh, three times. Uh, so in my first book, The Elusive Embrace, I was sort of uh, trying to uh, reflect on my uh, life uh, as a gay person who sort of unexpectedly became a parent, uh, now twice over. Uh, and I found myself constantly thinking about ancient Greek texts as a kind of a crutch to think about these uh, competing worlds, let's say, of desire on the one hand and paternity on the other. And uh, and then in this book I published uh, called The Lost in 2006, I was writing, uh, a, which really was a sort of mystery story, it's a family story about uh, my mother's relatives who were killed in the Holocaust um, in eastern Poland. And no, we never really knew what happened to them, although in some sense we obviously knew what happened to them. Uh, and I decided uh, in, when I turned 40 that I was going to sort of go back to this little town in Eastern Europe and find out if anyone knew anything specifically about them. And in that book, I sort of tied this search narrative to a series of reflections on the text of Genesis, uh, which I felt kept illuminating the story that I wanted to tell. For example, you know, it's funny when you're working on a book, and I know there are people in this room who know about this when you're working on a book, do you guys have to write theses, senior theses, or anything like that? So whenever, it doesn't have to be a book, even a long paper or whatever, you know, you find out that everything is about your book, you know, <laughs> suddenly everything, like you're watching MTV, and it's like, my God, that's about my book, you know. So I was writing this story of how I went to Eastern Europe, and I was interviewing people, and I went to this little town where my relatives lived, and I started interviewing people. And, and I just kept thinking for the first time in a very long time, I have to say, about my Bible education when I was a child, and how there were stories in the Bible which suddenly seemed to be uh, radioactive with meaning for me. For example, and I talk about this in my book, the story of Noah's Noah and the Ark it suddenly seemed to me very obvious that this was a story about mass annihilation and what it meant to be a survivor, right? Uh, which is, of course, the story I was telling. So I got into this groove where I uh, would tie these personal narratives to ancient texts. But the jackpot uh, uh, was when, uh, now seven years ago, it's already receding in time, um, I was about to teach a seminar at Bard College. What is that noise? Something's happening with your computer. I don't have a computer. <laughs> oh, this computer. <laughs> uh, I, you didn't know I had a soundtrack, right? Um, Lady Gaga. Uh, so, uh, so several years ago, I was about to teach this seminar on the Odyssey to my undergraduates at Bard, and the phone rings one January night, and it's my 81-year-old father who decides he wants to be in my freshman course. And that's what this book is about. So I'm going to talk about that, but I thought it would be uh, fun to start out by reading uh, just a little bit from the very beginning of the book, so there's no setup, there's no anything. This is the first couple of pages of the book, just to give you a flavor of how the book works, and then I'll talk to you a little bit about it. So this is the very beginning of the book. I should say that uh, one of the ways that this book is structured is that it, it mimics the structure of the Odyssey itself. And how many people here are taking classics courses right now? <laughs> 
And how many of you have read any epic? Any kind of epic, even like Game of Thrones. OK. So <laughs> my favorite show. Can't wait for the finale. Um, so, so the question is, do you think Daenerys Targaryen is going to like get with Jon Snow, or are they going to be enemies? <laughs> no, but that's the question, right? Why not both? Why not bo that's like my parents' marriage. OK, so, <laughs> so, so, which you're about to hear about also. So, um, so yeah, I'm going to stop talking and start reading. OK. so. I was saying that I structured the book on the Odyssey. So as you know, all epics begin with what's called a proem, which is the introductory part where the poet asks the muse for help in telling this very long story. And, um, and the first sort of chapter of my book is called Proem. And each of the sections is modeled on a certain section or theme of the Odyssey. And so this is where I sort of tell you what the book's going to be about. <clears throat> One January evening a few years ago, just before the beginning of the spring term in which I was going to be teaching an undergraduate seminar on the Odyssey, my father, a retired research scientist who was then aged 81, asked me for reasons I thought I understood at the time if he could sit in on the course, and I said yes. Once a week for the next 16 weeks, he would make the trip between the house in the Long Island suburbs where I grew up, a modest split level in which he still lived with my mother, to the Riverside campus of the small college where I teach, which is called Bard. At 10 past 10 each Friday morning, he would take a seat among the freshmen who were enrolled in the course, 17 or 18 year olds, not even a quarter his age, and join in the discussion of this old poem, an epic about long journeys and long marriages and what it means to yearn for home. It was deep winter when the term began, and when my father wasn't trying to persuade me that the poem's hero, Odysseus, wasn't, in fact, a real hero, because he would say, he's a liar and he cheated on his wife, he was worrying a great deal about the weather the snow on the windshield, the sleet on the roads, the ice on the walkways. He was afraid of falling, he said, his vowels still marked by his Bronx childhood, falling. Because of his fear of falling, we would make our way gingerly along the narrow asphalt paths that led to the building where the class met, a brick box as studiedly inoffensive as a Marriott, or up the little walkway to the steep gabled house at the edge of campus that, for a few days each week, was my home. To avoid having to make the three-hour trip twice in one day, he would often spend the night in that house, sleeping in the extra bedroom that serves as my study, stretched out on a narrow day bed that had been my childhood bed, a low wooden bed that my father built for me with his own hands when I was old enough to leave my crib. Now, there was something about this bed that only my father and I knew. It was made out of a door, a cheap hollow door to which he had screwed four sturdy wooden legs, securing them with metal brackets that are as solidly attached today as they were 50 years ago when he first joined the steel to the wood. This bed, with its amusing little secret, unknowable unless you hauled off the mattress and saw the panel door beneath, was the bed on which my father would sleep that spring semester of the Odyssey seminar, not long before he became ill, and my brothers and sister and I had to start fathering our father, anxiously watching him as he slept fitfully in a series of enormous, elaborately mechanized contraptions that hardly seemed like beds at all, purring noisily as they inclined and declined like cranes. But that came later. The Odyssey course ran from January to early May. A week or so after it ended, I happened to be on the phone with my friend Froma, a classic scholar who had been my mentor in graduate school and had lately enjoyed hearing my periodic reports about Daddy's progress over the course of the Odyssey seminar. 
At some point in the conversation, she mentioned a Mediterranean cruise that she had taken a couple of years before called Retracing the Odyssey. You should do it, Froma exclaimed. After this semester, after teaching the Odyssey to your own father, how could you not go? Not everyone agreed. When I emailed a travel agent friend of mine to ask her what she thought, her response came back with that within a minute. Avoid theme cruises at all costs. <laughs> but Froma had been my teacher, and I was still in the habit of obeying her. The next morning, when I called my father and told him about my conversation with her, he made a non-committal noise and said, let's see. We went online to look at the Cruise Line's website. As I slumped on the sofa in my apartment in New York, a little worn out by another week of traveling up and down Amtrak's northeast corridor, staring at my laptop, I can picture him sitting in the crowded home office that had once been the bedroom that I slept in, the simple low beds that he had built, and the plain oak desk, long since replaced by particle board desks from Staples, whose slick black surfaces were already bowed by the weight of the computer equipment on top, the desktops and monitors and laptops and printers and scanners, the looping cables and swags of cords and winking lights, giving it all the air of a hospital room. The cruise, we read, would follow the mythic hero's convoluted decade-long journey <clears throat> as he made his way home from the Trojan War, plagued by shipwrecks and monsters. It would begin at Troy, the site of which is located in what is now Turkey, and end on Ithaki, a small island in the western Greek sea that purports to be Ithaca, the place Odysseus called home. Retracing the Odyssey was an educational cruise, and although my father was contemptuous of anything that struck him as a needless luxury, cruises and sightseeing and vacations, he was a great believer in education. And so a few weeks later, in June, fresh from our recent immersion in the text of Homer's poem, we took the cruise, which lasted 10 days in all, one, for, one day for each year of Odysseus' long journey home. During our voyage, we saw nearly everything we had hoped to see, the strange new landscapes and the debris of the various civilizations that had once occupied them. We saw Troy, which to our untrained eye looked like nothing so much as a sandcastle that's been kicked in by a malicious child its legendary heights reduced by now to a random agglomeration of columns and huge stones blindly facing the sea below. We saw the Neolithic monoliths on the island of Gyozo off Malta, where there is also a cave that is said to have been the home of Calypso, the beautiful nymph on whose island Odysseus was stranded for seven years during his travels and who offered him immortality if only he would forsake his wife for her but he refused. We saw, we visited the desolate spot on the Campanian coast near Naples that, the ancient believe, <clears throat> was the entrance to Hades, the land of the dead, that being another unexpected stop on Odysseus's journey toward home, but perhaps not so unexpected because, after all, we must settle our accounts with the dead before we can get on with our living. We saw fat Venetian forts squatting on parched Peloponnesian meadows like frogs on a heath after a fire near Pylos in southern Greece, Homer's Pylos, a town where, according to the poet, a kindly if somewhat long-winded old king named Nestor is said to have reigned and where he once entertained the young son of Odysseus who had come there in search of information about his long-lost father which is how the Odyssey begins, a son gone in search of an absent parent. And of course, we saw the sea too, always the sea with its many faces, glass smooth and stone rough, at certain times blithely open and at others tightly inscrutable, sometimes of a weak blue so clear you could see straight down to the sea urchins at the bottom, <clears throat> 
as spiked and expectant as minds left over from some war whose causes and combatants no one any longer remembers, and sometimes of an impenetrable purple that is the color of the wine that we refer to as red, but the Greeks call black. We saw all those things during our travels, all those places, and learned a great deal about the peoples who had once lived there. My father, in whom a crabbed cautiousness about the dangers of going pretty much anywhere had given rise to certain notorious sayings that we, his five children, loved to make fun of. For example, the most dangerous place in the world is a parking lot. People drive like maniacs in parking lots. My father came to relish his stint as a Mediterranean tourist. But in the end, as the result of a string of irritating events beyond the control of the captain or his crew, which I will describe presently, we were unable to make the last stop on the itinerary. And so we never got to Ithaca, the place to which Odysseus strove so famously to return, never reached what may be the best known des destination in world literature. But then the Odyssey itself filled as it is with sudden mishaps and surprising detours, schools its hero in disappointment and teaches its audience to expect the unexpected. For this reason, our not reaching Ithaca may have been the most Odyssean aspect of our educational cruise. <clears throat> Expect the unexpected. Late in the autumn that same year, a few months after my father and I returned home from our trip, which I would sometimes joke with daddy, because we had never reached our goal, could still be considered to be incomplete, could be thought of as ongoing, my father fell. So that's the beginning of the journey that the book describes. And, you know, spoiler alert, um, as in many a proem, you get a sense of the full arc of the poem. Uh, I don't think the Greeks were as worried about spoilers as Rotten Tomatoes is. Um, <laughs> Uh, so you know right away at the beginning of this book that my father is going to die, basically. Um, and uh, basically what happened was this. So he asked me to come and sit in on my course. And I have to say, at the beginning I had very mixed reactions. My father was a scientist, as I said, uh, a research mathematician. Um, and had been a great sort of Latin jock in high school in the 1940s in the Bronx, uh, where he grew up. Uh, and so he also always fancied himself a, a kind of a lapsed classicist. Um, and so he actually, I have to give him credit, uh, when I announced uh, in like my second week of college that I was going to be a classics major and study Greek, I probably had the only Jewish parents on the eastern seaboard who welcomed that announcement uh, uh, instead of beating their heads uh, uh, with their hands uh, because my father thought it was so great because he had studied Latin. He thought that was kind of cool. And as I then went uh, through undergraduate life and went to graduate school eventually, he, um, he very much enjoyed, uh, you know, m tracking my uh, progress. So on the one hand, I thought he would be okay in the class. On the other hand, he was my father. Uh, my father was a kind of a uh, tough character. Uh, he had a rather uh, difficult childhood. He was born a month before the stock market crashed at the beginning of the Great Depression. My grandfather, his father was a union electrician, who was often out of work. Uh, for months at a time. He grew up quite poor. He was the youngest child. Both of his parents were working, and so he was alone quite often, and that's when he became a reader. Uh, my grandparents were great people, but they were not particularly, they themselves had never gotten beyond high school. Um, and so he was a sort of a prodigy, but he liked to think of him as a tough guy, think of himself as a tough guy. And so I had this creeping suspicion that it was not going to go 
smoothly. So I talked to him, you know, so I said, do you really want to sit in a classroom with 17 college freshmen and you're 81 and take the court? And he said, yeah, yeah, I could do it. So um, I said, well, are you going to participate? Do you want to do the homework? Are you going to write the paper? Like, how involved? And he said, no, I'm just going to sit in the back. I'm not going to say a word. <laughs> So the first day of class, I am giving, so this is a small seminar, and we all sit around a rectangular table and talk about the, you know, the, the readings. We did two books a session for 12 sessions. Um, <clears throat> but on the first day, and you want the discussion to flow and blah, 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 but you know, on the first day, you have to do your introductory spiel. And so, you know, it's always a little difficult, particularly when you're teaching first-year students who haven't been in a college class before, they don't, you know, know what the dynamic is, and you have to sort of assert your authority, but you don't want to crush their originality, and you know, you're bouncing a lot of balls in the air, so it's always a little difficult without your father in the room, you know, uh, and so on the first day of class, I'm giving my spiel about Homer and the Homeric question and orality and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like literally 38 seconds into my thing. And my father, who, let me add, so we're sitting at a table. And let's say I'm at the head of the table and you are in the foot of the table. But my father would always not sit at the table. He sits slightly to my left and behind me. <laughs> so I had to keep abandoning my students to talk to him as I soon found. So I'm 38 seconds into my spiel and my father says, I don't know what's supposed to be so great about this guy Odysseus. He's no hero. He's, he, he cheats on his wife. He sleeps with all these goddesses. He loses all his men. He said, I was in the army. This guy would have been court-martialed. <laughs> and of course, the thing that he really hated about Odysseus, so a lot of you have read the Odyssey, right? Is that he cries. Odysseus always crying. Everyone in Greek epic is crying. <laughs> it's amazing they had time to invent democracy. <laughs> They'd really be crying now. Um, so, so he says, I was in the army, nobody cried. That was day one. <laughs> and the students are sitting there open mouthed. And I'm like, you know, because usually when you are teaching undergraduates, you are A, the oldest person in the room, and B, the most authoritative person in the room. And suddenly, you know, my father's presence in the classroom sort of opened up this rift in the space time continuum because. <laughs> I kept having to argue with him about every single thing uh, in the poem. And the sort of ongoing uh, joke, almost, of my book is, so the book uh, follows the course of the semester from January to May and starts with book one and ends with book 24 uh, and interspersed with, and I sort of, um, I sort of describe certain crucial class discussions that we had about different parts of the text that I thought were really uh, relevant, you know, for this father-son story. I mean, the interesting thing about the Odyssey is, you know, probably if you go out into the street and you yank someone off the street and say, what is the Odyssey about? Sort of everybody knows that it's about this guy who takes a very long time to get home from the war because he's trying to get home to his wife. Everybody knows that. What's really interesting when you study the Odyssey is, you know, there's a lot more real estate, as we say in the writing business, that's devoted to fathers and sons, actually, than there is to husbands and wives, or at least just as much. The Odyssey is very worried about fathers and sons. As you know, those of you who have read the text, right, it begins not with Penelope, not with the wife, but with the son, Telemachus, who's now 20 years old. His father has been gone for 20 years, and he has to find out what happened to dad and grow up. And that takes four books. You don't even meet Odysseus, really, until book five. And of course, the first thing you know about him is that he's crying. Um, <laughs> and of course, the book does not end 
the climax, one could say, the final moment of the book is not his reunion with his long lost wife, but his reunion with his long lost father. So it begins with his son and ends with his father. And I, I mean, all kidding aside, this is of course something classicists know about and we study and we talk about, but I have to say, having my father sitting behind me the whole time made me much more aware of the Odyssey as a text about fathers and sons. And one of the things that I sort of do in my book is sort of map uh, through flashbacks to my own childhood and growing up, my relationship with my father, which was not by any means easy for a very long time, uh, onto Telemachus's search for his father. So in a certain sense, my personal narrative in the book becomes a search for my father to know who this crabby, grumpy old guy is. And uh, so as you know, those of you who have read the text, for example, uh, just to show you how I sort of map my narrative onto the narrative of the Odyssey, you know that in books three and four, Telemachus goes on this fact-finding mission. He finally leaves home and he sails <coughs> off uh, to interview uh, two of his father's old buddies, Nest, long-winded Nestor. I always like to say, if he were alive, he'd be paid by the word. Um, <laughs> Nestor and then uh, Menelaus in book four, the king of Sparta, who has now been reunited with his wayward wife, Helen of Troy, uh, my favorite character in Greek literature. Uh, because she pretends to be sorry all the time, but she's not really sorry. Um, and, you know, isn't that true? You know, pen, I just think Helen represents that person you hated in high school who gets away with everything and still is the prom queen at the end of it. Um, so he goes to interview Nestor in book three, and he learns a few things about his father, not a lot. He interviews Menelaus and Helen, one of the most exciting parts of the Odyssey, as far as I'm concerned, and learns maybe not about a lot about Odysseus, but a lot about marriage. Um, <laughs> and so in my book, I actually did this. I, after my father died, um, in fact, I went and interviewed uh, his oldest friend, uh, and also my uncle, my dad's oldest brother, who's st still alive, he's 98, uh, a World War II veteran, uh, snappy as can be. Um, and so I sort of purposely recreated this sort of fact-finding mission. And in the course of my conversations with these two men, I actually learned things about my father that were very surprising. And you could say that the whole trajectory of my book is uh, very Odyssean, as you know from studying the text, many of you, that you know, the great central question of the Odyssey is identity. How do you know who somebody is? complicated by the fact that, as we know, and as my father immediately uh, sort of glommed onto, Odysseus is a great bullshitter, right? So it's hard enough to know who somebody is, but when the somebody in question is a great liar, it's much more complicated. And it becomes much more complicated for him when he finally stops lying and wants to be recognized, and then it turns out he's dug himself a deep hole. Um, and so these questions of identity sort of floated through my head as I was writing the book, because in a lot of ways, my book is sort of a gentle sort of Telemachean effort to understand my father, who was, you know, in many ways is a great guy, and in many ways was very difficult. And, you know, in Greek literature, people are always saying, and in the Odyssey in particular, you know, that's, you know, you're never going to be as good as your father. Uh, and, and I think during this course of, how, during the course of the events I describe in the book, first having my father as a student, <clears throat> and then going on this cockamamie cruise with him, recreating the voyages of Odysseus, which I'll get to in a minute, um, I learned things about him. It was like I was seeing him with new eyes in many ways, and had a much deeper appreciation for him than I had ever had uh, when I was growing up. And so <clears throat> that was the course. All kinds of things happened in the course. You know, so all kidding aside, he kept asking very provocative, you know, he's like your sort of nightmare student and your dream student all at the same time because you want your students to think for themselves, although you don't necessarily want them to interrupt you every five minutes. Um, and he was, 
you know, it's funny, I look back at that semester and I think my father taught these students two things, which I didn't, you know, it's hard when you're teaching, especially when you're teaching a text that you really love and you want your students to love it the way that you want it and they have their own ideas and there's this funny little tug of war. But I think my father taught my students two things. The obvious one, which I'd never thought of until much too late and much too late to thank him, was his constant opposition to me in the classroom, which I describe in the book, which became very hilarious. Actually, although it was incredibly irritating to me at the time, I think it emboldened these students to be much more independent-minded than they would have been, especially freshmen. You know, they were much more feisty, and you know, the sort of climax of the semester part of the book is when there's this sort of open rebellion by my students who, who are egged on by my father to sort of <laughs> resist a, a interpretation of mine. And one of them said, you know, I always think you're trying to impose your interpretations on us instead of letting us do it for ourselves. And he was right. You know, I love the Odyssey so much, I wanted them to love it exactly the way I wanted it. And that can be a problem when you're teaching. Um, and it was about Odysseus's ventures in books 9 through 12, where he tells about everything that happened to him since the fall of Troy. All the famous stuff, the Cyclops, the, 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 the Lotus Eaters, the Sirens, all of that. And the kids had this idea that it was all made up. <clears throat> Because we only know about that stuff from Odysseus when he's telling the Phaeacians over dinner about everything that happened to him. And they were like, what if he made it all up? Because actually every one of his adventures sort of corresponds to something that we know actually happened to him because Homer tells us. And I was like, no, 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 no. You know? And then they like, there was a revolution in the classroom. <laughs> so, and it was all because of my father. And I'm now great, I wish he were here because I could thank him because I think it made them better students actually, to think for themselves, to have their own ideas instead of just taking notes and nodding. The other thing, of course, that he taught them, which was so touching, I think, is, um, you know, you guys have to take courses, many of you. You have to do a this distribution and a that requirement and a humanities thing and a literature thing and, you know, rocks for jocks and blah, blah, blah. But there was my father, 81, driving three hours each way every week so he could be in this class. And I think that was a great, a great example, you know, that it doesn't end when you graduate. You can still want to keep knowing stuff. Um, so I always think of that now. Then we went on the cruise. So who goes on a cruise that recreates the voyages of Odysseus? you may ask. Well, it turns out everybody there was like my age with an octogenarian parent. <laughs> you know, and I was, <laughs> here I thought we were going to be so special, you know. Um, but it's actually great. It was a, there were only about 80 people, I think, on this little steamship chugging through the Mediterranean. All kinds of amazing things happen, as you would expect on a cruise that recreates the voyages of Odysseus. Um, and it was on the cruise where I really began to appreciate something else about the Odyssey. You know, so here's a poem that's obsessed with identity in the most fundamental, how do you know who you are? And you know because many of you have read it, the whole question of who he is and the meaning of his name and how it has to do with pain and all of this stuff. And, you know, but he's also a master of disguise and he's a great liar, so he's constantly concealing his identity just so he can get home in order to reveal his identity again. But when he finally does, Penelope is like, meh, you know, <laughs> prove it. And then what do you do, right? And as you know, spoiler alert, it all has to do with the construction of this special bed um, that only the two of them know about, right? It's like, I always think, you know, how do you prove who you are in the age before driver's licenses? and passports. It's a good question. We're so used to this stuff. You know, passwords, handles, all of that. We're constantly having to prove our identity. But the fact is, we're constantly having to prove our identity in exactly the way Odysseus has to prove his identity at the end of the Odyssey, which is a secret, a shared secret, something only you and Siri know. 
right? You know, my, the day I adopted my dog or whatever, right? But that's what the Odyssey is about, right? It's about what's inside of you, right? This irreducible es essence of knowledge. Because you know what, I, you're young, but trust me, as you get older, you don't look like who you used to be anymore. Wait till you go to your 10th high school reunion, or as I just did, my 40th high school reunion, and people walk up to you and say, hi, it's me. And you're like, you know, they're like, we dated. And I'm like, ha ha, you know. So that's Odysseus's, that's Odysseus's problem at the end of the Odyssey. When you get back, you know, 20 years of hardship changes you. You literally are unrecognizable. So how do you prove? Well, it's a secret. It's something in your head, not on your body, right? And so here's this poem that's obsessed with identity and recognition and all these very complicated and wonderful ways. And I felt that on the cruise, you know, um, I saw aspects of my father that I had never seen before. Because the other thing that, uh, that the Odyssey teaches is that travel is transformative, right? That's why you go on your junior year abroad, presumably. You want that just being in contact with different kinds of situations, different kinds of people, different locales, will change who you are. So the fact is, of course, the joke of the Odyssey has to prove he's the same guy who went away, but he's not the same guy who went away. Nobody is the same. When you go to your 40th high school reunion, you are not the same person you were in 1978. Hopefully, right? Um, and he just, you know, my dad, because I think he grew up poor and in the Depression, he was very anxious about, as I said in those opening pages, anything that seemed luxurious to him, even though he was comfortably middle class at the end and he could afford to go on vacations. He never did because he was anxious. You know, he always thought the wolves were at the door. But on this cruise, he became this totally other person. And he was kind of a tough, you know, as I've said, he was kind of an irascible guy. Um, but on the cruise, he became totally different. It was like this aspect of him that had never been allowed to flower suddenly came out and suddenly Everyone kept coming up to me and saying, oh, your father is so charming. And, and I was like, him? You know, really? Because I always think of him in the way I've been describing him to you. You know, he's like, well, I want, here's a story about my father. When I was in graduate school and I went into therapy, just so I could finish my dissertation, and <clears throat> I'm still seeing her 30 years later. And, <laughs> And I write it off as a business expense. So, um, <laughs> so I was saying, you know, my father, my father pushed us very hard in school. You know, everything for him was about success because he came from nothing. And so it was all about pushing yourself, get the degree, do well, get an A, blah, blah. And I was kvetching to my therapist one day. I said, you know, he never asked me, like, am I dating someone? Do I have a life outside of graduate school? You know. So my therapist said, you know, you should just tell him. And I was like, okay. So the next time I'm on the phone with my father, and he's like, so what are you taking? You know, and how are you doing? And how did the paper go? And he's like, Dad, you never asked me, like, how's my love life? Am I seeing any? He's like, ah, that's your personal life. <laughs> I was like, you're my father, you know. So that was my dad. But on the cruise, he was transformed like one of those magical transformations in the Odyssey, which brings me to my final reading. And then uh, we'll talk a little bit if there are any questions. But the thing he hated most about the Odyssey, aside from Odysseus, <laughs> he couldn't believe. You know, it's funny. When you're a writer or an intellectual or a professor or a word person in any kind of way, a reader, <laughs> you automatically think Odysseus is great because he's a master of language. He's a punster, he's a storyteller, he's a fabricator, he's a... And, you know, I have to say my father was not stupid. You know, he's a very well-read person, actually. And it seems so transparent to a person like me who's a writer that Odysseus is a hero that it was actually good to be reminded that, you know, he's not so great a lot of the time, you know, and that there's always somebody on the other end of a lie, someone who's being deceived, seduced, bamboozled. And I, I began to see that for the first, um, for the first time. 
So, but the thing he hated the most about Odysseus, aside from the fact that he cheated on his wife and he lost all of his men somehow by the time he got home, and he lied and, and he cries, is that he got help from the gods. He's like, if he was so great, he wouldn't need help from the gods, you know. And the worst kind of help from my father were those magical transformations, like when Athena pops up and says, oh, now you look like an old man, you know, or whatever. <laughs> or, conversely, what one hopes for as one gets older, you know, now you're young and beautiful. Um, so the last passage I'm going to uh, read um, has to do with the end. It's on the very last day of class. So we're talking about the reunion between Penelope and Odysseus, the climax of the whole recognition theme. and how it's this little shared piece of knowledge that they both have, you know, how the bed was made that finally allows them to recognize each other. And the kids just weren't getting it. And there was a very kind of flat feeling in the classroom um, because they're 18. You know, here I'm talking about a poem in which a guy goes missing for 20 years and they're not even 18 years old. You know, it's hard to explain you'll understand better when you go to your 20th high school reunion what it's like to see somebody again. And, and it just wasn't working. And at that moment, when I was sort of trying to get my kids to understand how great the end of the Odyssey is, and it wasn't working, my father rescued me by interrupting in an incredible uh, way. And this is just the last thing I'm going to read. So, I had been talking about this climactic moment, and, and my father <laughs> said, I'll explain this. <laughs> he said, I know something about this. So that's where this section starts. I know something about this. It was May of 2011, on the last day of the Odyssey course, and my father was sitting against the wall beneath the window in the same seat he had taken 15 weeks earlier, that cold January morning when I'd looked over this unknown crew of teenagers for the first time, and he was saying, I know something about this. The students looked at him, and then he went on, face it. I'm the only one here who knows what it's like to be with someone so long that they don't look anything like the person you started out with. <laughs> of course he was right. They were 18, maybe 19 now. I couldn't imagine on this May day when my father started speaking about what it was like to watch as someone you knew long and well grew unrecognizably old, someone whom the habits of love and intimacy had grooved into your body, I couldn't imagine how old 81 must seem to these kids. As he began to speak, I imagined the students silently studying his lined face, the age spots, the thin fluff clinging to his taut scalp. I looked at him too, and suddenly I thought, this is what Athena makes Odysseus look like when she waves her wand at him in Book 13. And then I quote the poem, the skin withered on his curved limbs, the flaxen hair vanished from his head, and round all his limbs she fixed an old man's skin, and the light went out of his eyes, which were once so lovely. I know about this, Daddy was saying. His mother, he went on, shaking his head and staring down at the floor as he pointed at me, his mother was once the most beautiful girl, not pretty, beautiful. <laughs> As I had done once many years before when I was in high school and he was telling a neighbor how terrific my mother had looked at some event, a bar mitzvah or a wedding, I thought, why doesn't he ever tell her that? But of course, I didn't say that now. Like the students, I remained quiet and I let my father talk. And it's funny, he went on, regaining his composure and squeezing his eyes tightly shut as he spoke, nodding up and down as if he were talking to himself just as he did when he was trying to remember some bit of trivia, the name of some character actor in an old movie, the batting average of a baseball star from his childhood, some fact that would prove to you that he was still as sharp as ever. It's funny, my father said, but I, have, I think this part of the poem is actually true. There are these things you have with someone, not physical things, but private jokes and memories you gather over time, little things that nobody else knows about. He looked up and saw the kids staring at him. A bit sheepish, suddenly, he tried to lighten the mood. 
Well, sometimes it's physical things, he said. <laughs> I was too startled to say anything. But I was realizing not only that he was right, but how deeply right he was. I was realizing for the first time how much the Odyssey knows about this ostensibly trivial but profound real-life phenomenon, the way that small things between people can be the foundation of the greatest intimacy, and not just between husbands and wives or lovers. I thought about our secret nickname for him, Daddy Loopy. I thought about the bed upstairs in my study with the silly secret of its construction. When my father said, well, sometimes it's physical things. I expected the students to react, perhaps to laugh, but they were rapt. Nobody said a word. He went on, like I said, I think the poem is right about this one thing. When you have those things, those things that couples have, they keep you connected long after everything else becomes unrecognizable. He looked over at me then, as if to see whether I had registered that he was using this key word from our weeks of discussion of the Odyssey. Those are the things you hang on to, he went on, suddenly self-conscious. It's why you stick with this, this thing in the first place. He sat up straighter in the chair and gave his head a little shake then, as if to dispel the mood he'd created. Anyway, trust me, his mother was beautiful. <laughs> he jerked his head in my direction and then shrank back into his chair. The students stayed quiet. Well, what could they say? My parents' marriage had lasted three times as long as their entire lives. I could tell from their solemn faces as they stared across the room at him that they were impressed. I had the sudden sense that they were looking not at him, but up to him. And then, as I glanced around the table and felt their silence, I realized that this is what those magical transformations in the Odyssey are really about. It isn't magic at all. Something happens, someone speaks heatedly or with authority, with winged words, as Homer likes to say, and suddenly you see things differently. The person actually looks different to you. At the moment my father pushed himself back in the chair after admitting that the Odyssey had gotten this one thing right, that between couples there are secrets that serve in the end as the bedrock of marriage, secrets unknown even to the children of that marriage. At that moment it occurred to me that he looked bigger and more impressive somehow, the way that Odysseus looks taller and more beautiful when Athena needs him to succeed to impress some stranger in whose hands his fate hangs. On that May day, toward the end of the seminar, my father had succeeded too, with this fleeting display of tenderness before an audience of children too young to understand what they were witnessing. He had, for a moment, been transformed. Thank you. <clears throat> Do I, I, thank you. Um, I think we're supposed to do some, yes, some or we can do questions. You don't have to ask questions. Comments, questions? Yes. Was writing the book difficult emotionally for you? Was writing the book difficult emotionally? You know, it's funny because while I was writing the book, people kept asking me if it was hard because, so my father, Soon after we got back from the cruise, my father had a massive, unexpected stroke and died a few months later after making a typically tough, almost successful recovery. Um, so people said, well, you know, was it hard? And actually it wasn't, it wasn't hard emotionally because my father was dead by the time I started writing. Um, it was actually like a nice haunting. You know, because he was sort of, when I was writing about him, you know, I felt like he was around. And in fact, I wrote the book in my study, the study where this bed is that he built for me, and that's where he slept, you know. And so I was actually nice in a way. I was, you know, I took four years to write this book, and I felt like I was sort of keeping him afloat in some. 
Wait, you know what was the hardest part? Was finishing the book. And I had a very hard time finishing the book because the structure was very hard to get right because I, I wanted this, almost every scene in the book corresponds in some sly way to a scene in the Odyssey and I had to sort of really work that. And, a, but it went on and on and on and I had to keep futzing with it and it was, it's funny because my Holocaust book, which is twice as long as this book, took me a quarter of the time to write, actually. It took me exactly a year to write, and I literally spent four years writing this book. And a friend of mine said, I think you're not finishing this book because when you're finished with it, your father will really be dead to you. And I think that that was right. You know, it was very hard to let go of him in the way I had to have him in my head to write the book, you know. Um, so that was the hard part, you could say. Yes, and back. Um, after your father attended your class, did your curriculum change after, afterwards, or did it change after you wrote the book? That's a great question. So the question is, after my dad took the course, did, I, did the way I teach the course change in any way? Actually, the whole way I taught changed, um, actually. Because of the thing I was describing to you, you know, I tried to be a better listener and um, not impose my interpretations as hard as I used to on my students and to sort of listen more to this, what the students were telling me, you know, and not just filtering everything through my own ideas about the text. So I think, you know, it's, it's, it looked like my father was my student in this class, but of course I ended up being his student, you know, I think, in unexpected ways. So yeah, that's a great question. I think I always think, not only in the Odyssey course, obviously, but now I really try to be better, you know. Um, yeah, all the way in back. Do you have, um, other than these famous classics such as the Odyssey, do you have any other inspirational books that have helped you along the way to write? Uh, do I have inspirational books that have helped me to write apart from the great classics like the Odyssey? Well, I mean, I, there are many books floating in my head all the time. Uh, there are two important authors for me. So I once wrote a piece for The New Yorker about this. I, when I was a teenager, I started having a correspondence with an author who was then very, very famous and a huge best-selling author of historical novels set in ancient Greece called Mary Renault. And I read those books, and those are why I became a classicist. I mean, they totally made me go over. I should maybe not admit this, but I wanted to be an Egyptologist. Um, and I, like, I would literally walk around the house wearing Egyptian crowns made of bleach bottles. And when I was, when I was little, and I read these books, and they totally changed my life. And so that was very inspirational. I started corresponding with this author, and we corresponded until she died when I was in my 20s. A book that I always think of when people ask me about writing inspiration is a wonderful author whom some of you will know called Anne Lamott. Um, it was very funny, and she wrote this fabulous book called Bird by Bird, which is about how to write. And the joke is that there's this family story in her family. She had a brother who was in grade school, and he had to write a report about birds, and he kept goofing off and procrastinating. Not that I know anything about that. And um, finally, it was the day before the report was due, and the, the brother tearfully says to the father, I I don't know what to do. And he said, just take it bird by bird. You know, you just, you, when you get to the point of having to write a long thing in your life, you know, there's only one way to do it, which is bit by bit. And I always, you know, look, even when you write papers and you open your Word file and there's that empty thing staring you in the face, it's intimidating. Um, and I always think, you know, I'm going to do it bird by bird one paragraph at a time. You can't, you can't say, I'm going to write a book. You'll never do it, you know? But you think, OK, I can write a few paragraphs about my night in Baltimore or whatever, you know? So I think about that. That's been really, really inspirational for me. You know, it's a very hard thing to do to create anything. 
you know, people are saying, because I have this other sort of career aside from writing these memoir ebooks of being a critic, you know, and people always say things like, oh, but you know, uh, which do you prefer, writing criticism or your creative work? And I'm like, all writing is creative, because how do I know that? Because when you open the Word file, there's nothing there. <laughs> and then when you're finished, there's something there, whether it's a book review or a novel. So hello, I'm creative, you know. Um, but I do think, it's a, if you're interested in writing, it's a fabulous book, and funny as hell, too. She's incredibly funny. Um, if you ever want to have a baby, you should read her book called Operating Instructions, which is about how she became pre pregnant and gave birth. And it is the single funniest book you will ever read in your entire life. Um, yeah, anybody else? Usually, my mother will ask a question if I do a reading within 100 miles of Long Island. But luckily, we're farther away than that. And the question now is, as she said to me on the phone the other day, she said, what do I have to do? to get you to write a book about me, die? <laughs> and I said, yes. <laughs> Thank you.